for part two, the deep dive into science. Dog longevity, okay? I did the quick intro video that you got last time, and this time the first thing I wanna do is dive into that paper, come on paper, 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 that talked about how uh, basically dog ownership helped extend lifespan. And the paper's name is Dog Ownership and the Risk of Cardiovascular, Cardiovascular Disease and Death, a Nationwide Cohort Study. And in the paper, they looked at 3 million Swedes and followed them up for a total of 12 years. They concluded, in conclusion, in a nationwide, a nationwide population-based study with 12 years of follow-up, we showed dog ownership is associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease in single households with a reduced risk of cardiovascular and all-cause death in the general population. They found the relationship between cardiovascular disease and, and dog ownership was particularly strong in single-person households where it was just, you know, the owner and their happy little dog. They cited mechanisms such as a reduction of stress, increased exercise, perhaps more social interaction as you're out walking your dog, and, you know, a number of other features that just might be related to dog ownership. Okay, back to the kennel. Let's take a look at the dogs themselves. First of all, you may have noticed that different dog breeds live longer than others. And I'm going to put a chart up here. And let's look at this chart. Come on, chart. And this chart looks at human age on the vertical axis and dog age on the horizontal. You can see by the colored lines, with green being large dogs over 50 pounds, blue medium dogs, two, 21 to 50 pounds, and red small dogs, 20 pounds and under. If you look at how dogs evolve, that is, slow, a, a slowly to a slowly medium-sized animal, and how, you know, if you look today, we have done a lot of breeding, and we've bred large dogs for guardian dogs, and we've bred small little toy poodles for companions, and so forth, and you find the rapid evolution that we've caused by creating these specialized breeds for hunting, and working, and herding, and so forth, we cause changes in size to happen the most rapidly, but not everything on the inside changed as quickly. And so like, for instance, with the great, like I used to have Great Pyrenees, beautiful 120 pound great dogs, they tend to only live to be 10, 12 years old because, you know, maximally and some die younger because their hearts just don't keep up with that large size that they, you know, that they, you know, and all of that cardiovascular work that they have to do for all that muscle and tissue. So that's one of the reasons why. But just like humans, dogs have their longevity stars as well. So just, I want you to just take a moment. How long do you think the oldest dog has lived to? You got it? Got it in your head? Okay, hold that. The oldest dog, I'm gonna pull the chart out here. Come on, chart, okay. The oldest dog was an Australian cattle dog and it lived 29 years and 160 days. The next up was a beagle that lived 28 years and it goes on and um, there's a Shibu Inu that lived 26 years. There's even a little Dachshund that lived to 20. I'm sure there are great stories behind all of these dogs. Take a look at a couple of pub uh, publications from the Dog Aging Project and take a look at their website. It's the dogagingproject.org and just as an update, they're starting to enroll dogs for their actual uh, longevity study now. Okay, and this is a collaboration of the University of Washington and Texas A&M and they're giving rampamycin to improve the, the heart, the heart the, the, improve the health of their dogs. So, in the first paper that they wrote, they, provide, they provided a rationale. Why are they doing this, okay? And I'd like to read a quote from the paper because it's long. Canis familiaris offers a unique opportunity for surmounting this barrier in the near future, that is aging. In particular, companion dogs share our environment and play an important role in improving the quality of life for millions of people. Here we present 
a rationale for increasing the role of companion dogs as an animal model for both basic and clinical geroscience and describe complementary approaches on and ongoing projects to aimed at achieving this goal. Take a look at this chart that uh, reiterates the fact that the highest risk factor for many diseases is not obesity or alcohol, although they can play a role because you know they always give you all these studies. So if you drink less, you can increase your lifespan by blah, blah, blah. If you lose 10 pounds, you can increase. Okay, the greatest risk factor for all these diseases is aging. And that's why it's so important we crack this. Okay, so. Among the strategies that they're looking at, again going back to their paper again, is among these strategies two molecules have emerged as high priority candidates for clinical testing. Rapamycin, a rapamycin, a macrolide immunosuppressant agent, an mTOR inhibitor, and metformin, a bigwanid anti-hyperglycemic agents. Both drugs have extensive clinical history for their uses and have been reported to extend lifespan in invertebrate models and in mice, although the effects of rapamycin are more robust and reproducible than metformin in that regard. So they settled on using rapamycin for that reason. And there are two more uh, reasons that they use dogs, is that dogs age rapidly. You know, you've all heard the thing that dogs age, you know, it's not quite, a, it's not a linear thing with 10 years for every one human age. You know, I put the chart up there earlier, you can see the, the curves of it. But they don't live as long as us and they age faster. When they're 10, it's the equivalent of us being 60, 70, 80. Okay, so, the first trial that these people did was a safety trial. And take a look at this title. A randomized controlled trial to establish the effects of short-term rapamycin treatment in 24 middle-aged companion dogs. Okay, so again, why rapamycin? Well, as usual, we have some tantalizing studies in mice related to mTOR inhibition, one where the lifespan was extended from 20 to 60 percent. Let's translate that if we accept it for the purpose of calculation that the average human lifespan is 80 and this would, if it was, is 80. And that would mean we'd live another 16 to 48 years. I'll take 16 to 48. Or a range of lifespan from 96 to 128. Now these were mice in a nice safe environment. They didn't go diving with sharks. They didn't go bungee jumping. They didn't walk across the street when the light was red. So they didn't do the foolish things that humans sometimes do, because no matter what we do, we still often will have people who end their life really from, for foolish reasons. So they based their choice on rapamycin that low-dose rapamycin in, in mice has usually has few side effects, um, but long-term treatment is associated with defects in spermatogenesis and poor performance after a glucose tolerance test. So another study found no significant side effects in marmoset, mikey, uh, mumpy, uh, marmoset monkeys and a group of dogs treated with rapamycin for a glycogen storage disease had few side effects as well. A good side, a recent human study found six weeks of treatment with the rapamycin derivative rejuvenated their immune response as measured by a response to a flu vaccine. So they did the safety trial. What happened? What did we see? 23 dogs completed the 10-week study. They were divided into three groups, a placebo, low at 0.05 milligrams per kilogram, and a high dose at 0 um, 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. So it's still a pretty low dose, 0.05 and 0.01. And as well as a pool group that contained all the treated dogs. Now remember, this was a trial for safety, not, they didn't expect to see anything. They just wanted to make sure the dogs could tolerate it and would do well on it. 23 dogs completed the study and they divided the dogs into two groups, a low dose and a high dose and a pooled group that included all the dogs together. Now let's take a look at the chart of the results. When I look at it, my scientific eye, I see that most of the effects are not greatly different from the placebo effect except for one. Remember, these are older dogs, so they might, they might limp or vomit or something along that line just because of a factor of age. So the one that stands out is that seven of the high-dose group all showed an increase in energy. Now remember, this is just a 
trial for safety and it's again one of those little tantalizing things that we say oh something good might be happening is it we don't know yet so they discuss more about the measurements in detail in the paper but they're now enrolling for their actual treatment and I like this particular study best because of the population. It's all over the place, you know, who's going to have a dog getting a grain-free diet, who's going to get a raw diet, who's going to be doing something where they make all the food themselves, who's going to live with a rich owner, a poor owner, and so on. So I like the fact that it also reflects our environment. Okay, um, there's another study as well. They mentioned the heart disease is one of the greatest causes of death in human, resulting in one of four deaths. In this study where they assessed dogs cardiovascular disease that were nine years or older, and of the 40 dogs, 28% were assessed with some type of age-related cardiac problem. They argue that the dogs are a good model for studying how to treat degenerative heart disease in humans as it is slowly developing in both dogs and humans and often undiagnosed in both for long periods of time. Now, I'm eagerly awaiting their next publications, but they will be a year or more in the future. Okay, let's move on to George Church's project. Uh, his project is more classically scientific, okay? He's looking at one type of dog, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. He's looking at one particular ailment, mitral valve disease. Cavalier King Charles Spaniels often develop mitral heart valve disease, a breed that seems to be prone to this particular problem that's often silent. And his company, Rejuvenate Bio, have already used their gene therapy in mice, as I mentioned earlier, and they're not using CRISPR. Instead, they're just introducing genes that help using a classic method. And so something is added, but they don't edit anything in or out. They don't change the dog's genome, which I think is good because we don't know all of the interactions of all of our genes. If we take out one, it might be doing something that also enhances others. So we'll have to wait again for his results. Again, we're having kind of a dearth of breakthroughs at the moment, but we have to wait for that. Uh, and we're waiting for this study to commence. So. That's what we have on dog aging right now. And I'll put the link for the King Charles Spaniel with the AKC if you're a King Charles Spaniel owner so you can, you know, do your due diligence. Again, thank you for watching. There's going to be more and more upcoming. I have other things that I'm going to be talking about soon. Hopefully, shoes will drop. I'm waiting for shoes to drop. We know there are NMN trials out there that have gone on and so on. And people have hinted at commercialization of things and so, so forth. So let's see what happens. I'm sure come next spring, we'll have some really fantastic news. Until next time, this is Judy Chalice with Lifespan and Longevity. Remember to like, to share, and to comment because I love to hear from you.